Oh, it looks like we are live. Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Rich. I am joined by my good friend Steve Washington in just in a moment. I will welcome Steve to the show officially and read you his bio. But before I do, while we're waiting for folks to jump on, let's talk about some of our amazing sponsors. So that we can pay the bills around here, Steve. <laughs> Keep the lights on. Uh, uh, we got amazing sponsors like Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. Last night I was in jiu-jitsu class. Of course, it was no gi. Last night we were doing some Eddie Bravo 10th Planet stuff. And uh, not a whole lot of striking, but let me tell you something. In a real fight, there's probably going to be some striking going on. So pick up a Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. It is an amazing uh, training opponent. Also, pick up some CBD. I tell you what, man. My coach caught me in a, a bicep slicer last night. It is not, it is not feeling good. So <clears throat> I'll be putting some CBD salve on that for sure. Check everything that they have out at apphemp.com. That's Appalachian Standard. All the links to everything you're going to need are in the show notes today. So you can find them there and get a discount. Let's see what else we got here. We got Mountain Man Medical. We finally got the co-branded trauma kit with Mountain Man Medical. It was designed together with Brian McLaughlin over there, retired uh, former Navy corpsman, and my good friend Justin Carroll, who's a former for, um, force reconnaissance operator and MARSOC operator and is now a paramedic. We put together an amazing trauma kit for you. You're going to want to put one in your car. You're going to want to have one at home. You got a kid in the going back to the dorms, hopefully, and throwing that mask in the trash. Then uh, get, send them back to the dorm with a trauma kit that's been put together by the experts. So you can find links to our co-branded trauma kit in the links below. Cool Fire Trainer, man. We got 14 folks joining us so far, Steve. Everybody, please hit that share button, and I'll finish up with Cool Fire Trainer. <clears throat> is an amazing product. You want to take your dry fire training to the next level, you're definitely going to want to get that cool fire trainer uh, mountain man medical we already talked about that amazing sponsor let's talk about the last but certainly not least precision holsters makers of the ultra Penix holster that i and my dear friend mike seeklander wear as well as the competition line as well uh so thank you for all of our amazing sponsors now back to the show let's see who's on with us steve tony is on rudy is on john is on he says hi from yukon oklahoma coin number 1919 and if you want to find out what a coin member is you're going to have to join the american warrior society take a free 14-day trial check us out americanwarriorsociety.com find out if that's right for you um i guess i should tell everybody who i am my name is rich brown retired marine corps uh uh re retired marine corps officer former police officer corrections officer special operations officer co-host and co-founder of the american warrior society and we have 18 folks joining us. Everybody must want to see you this morning, Steve. <clears throat> Probably everybody from the office. Yeah. Dale is on. David is on. Says, good morning, Steve. Ed is on. Says, morning, everyone. Joe Baker is on. Elkie is on. From Colorado. Dale, Kevin, Roman, Raymond. Wow. Got 20 folks. Please hit that share button. Let me welcome Steve to the show real quick by reading his bio. Steve Washington is the owner of Protect. Protection Tactics Firearms Training in Cedar Springs, Michigan. Steve served 10 years in the United States Army and Michigan National Guard as a communications specialist in armor and military police units. After getting out of the Army, he became a financial advisor with a major bank, working his way up to being a vice president of investments. While running his training company, he has taught high school and social studies, health and business classes as a dad to four amazing daughters. <clears throat> He was introduced to the challenges of raising teenage girls and coach girls high school basketball for the last 11 years. Additionally, coaching boys and girls track for the last five. Steve is a USCCA certified firearms instructor and senior training counselor. He has trained over 10,000 students to get their concealed carry license, developed over 100 certified instructors and nearly 50 training counselors. And Steve is now the field training specialist for Delta Defense, which is a service provider for USCCA Steve, my good friend, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rich. I appreciate you having me on. I got to tell you, when I heard the coffee with Rich thing, I'm like, you know, I've never had a cup of coffee in my life. Are you serious? Why you, I'm serious. I did 10 years <clears throat> in the Army, five years of college, and never had a cup of coffee. So I figured I'd at least have my glass of water with you this morning. Cheers, my friend. Mm. Steve, it's always good to spend time with you, man. A little background on Steve. He came to... Uh, <clears throat> 
our farms instructor development course. I think it was the first open enrollment one we ran last year in Oklahoma. And Steve was the honor grad out of that course. And uh, we were privileged enough to have Steve come back and be one of our co-facilitators this year up in Michigan. So I appreciate you, Steve, for everything you've done to make that course better. Thank you. My pleasure. Let's talk about uh, what is your bio overlook? I mean, you got a very, a very extensive bio, Steve. What's it missing, man? Um, wow. I really don't spend a lot of time talking about myself. Uh, I just like to go out and do stuff. Um, for me, the big thing is just my purpose in life that I didn't get on the bio was just helping other people. Um, I love to just get my hands dirty with whatever's needed to get done. Um, with my experience from my military, uh, my military days with my time as a financial planner, um, working at high schools, just working with kids. My number one goal is to just help people get better at whatever it is that they strive at. Um, I'm almost done with my master's in training and development. So I just have a doggone thesis to write. And if I can write that thesis, that will be done. But um, for the most part, I'm just out having fun, just doing what I can to be better. Um, it's I'm just simple, man. <laughs> well, you're far from simple, my friend, but your passion is something that I've always uh, enjoyed about you. It, it just exudes from you. And I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you the audience a quick story. <clears throat> Me and Steve went to a sandwich shop up there in Michigan a couple weeks ago. And one of the, the uh, people working come running behind the counter and jumped in your arms. And I'm like, what in the heck is going on here? And you're like, yeah, I coached her and, and basketball. I'm like, but that's the impression you leave with people. And uh, you can see how excited she was to see you, man. And I, I love that. I, I, I want to I be that guy. You know what I mean? You know, it's, it's just a function of connecting with people. And anytime you are a leader or you are the face of something, you have to connect with your people. And if you get that connection, you know, there's no telling what lengths that you would go to. I was, as, as this happened, I was sharing with you, I'm like, in the last few years, she had um, family members pass away. She had both her feet reconstructed. She had her Achilles tendons on both feet, um, surgically cut to fix her feet. And this young lady, her name's Jade. Jade was just full of heart. And she would, she didn't tell me all of this stuff had happened to her. And I had to find out about this from her aunt, who was um, who she was staying with. And her aunt's like, yeah, he's like, can you keep an eye out on Jade? Because Jade's just had her foot operated on. I'm like, well, how long ago? She's like, well, she had it reconstructed in August. And this is in October. And she's trying to get back in condition for basketball. And anybody knows if you've had an Achilles reconstructed, you don't come back from that and get to 100% in a year and she just got she had just done that and the doctor had cleared her she's like okay you can start running lightly on it and here she is in conditioning trying to keep up with everybody trying to do this and, it, and i just told myself if she can be that committed to basketball as a freshman girl in high school how committed can we be when other stuff is going on here it is she's had her life flipped upside down, had her feet reconstructed, had all this stuff. And she's showing up in practice going, what can I do next, coach? How can I get better? How can I get better? And every day after practice, like, how can I get better, coach? What should I be working on? And I'm like, today, you just need to ice your feet. Yeah. And she's like, that's it, coach? I'm like, um, yeah, that's fine for now. I love that, man. And uh, that that girl, that that kind of heart, I wish, you know, I wish we had more Americans like that. Oh, absolutely. Benny is joining us. Margie is on. Tony says, I'm not sure how big that dude is, but that picture of him holding a basketball looked to me like he was holding a tennis ball. <laughs> yeah. You're a pretty tall fella. How tall yeah. are you, Steve? Um, Rich, I am 6'6", six, six, and I weigh about 320 pounds. Hopefully, um, we've got a biggest loser competition going on in the office now. So hopefully, I can get that down to around my, uh, my, my traditional fighting weight of about 250. But, you know, when you – pounding 6,000 calories a day to maintain weight in the army. And suddenly the army says, nah, you're done. And you're going, uh, I still like that 6,000 calories. It's the, uh, the running, the sitting, the pushing, the doing the pushups, all that stuff disappeared, but the calories didn't. Yeah. Speaking of the army, man, how did you get in the army, Steve? Um, well, this is a funny story because when I was in high school, I always wanted to go in the army and 
I can't believe I'm actually going to say this publicly, Rich, but I originally tried to get in the Marines. Oh, um, but I was a, I was a high school basketball player, um, pretty big guy overall. And I looked at the army and I looked at the Marines and when I met with the army first and I had ASVAB scores that were just off the charts. Um, they told me I could do whatever I wanted to. I think at the time I went in the school and the score maxed out at 150 and I had like 147 or 148 somewhere in there. Yeah. And the recruiter literally took my folder and saw my ASVAB score and said, wow, I didn't know the test went this high, close the folder, set it aside. And you're going to college. You're probably not even thinking of the military. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. That's when I was 17 and I was a senior in high school. Might have been a junior, but I just at that point in time was like, oh, I guess I shouldn't do the military. I guess I should just go to college. Turned around, went to college, got out of college, a few twists and turns in life. And here I am, 25 years old, going, you know what? My life is not where I want it to be right now. I should probably look at the military again. I've always wanted to do it. Went to the Marines. Marines were like, nope, too big, too heavy way too much worked my tail off tried to lose weight couldn't get that last little bit done got depressed put on another 50 pounds and said you know what? let me look at all the other branches looked at the other branches and the army was like yeah we'll still take you so i went into the army when i was 26 years old weighing 310 pounds and went to basic and while i was at basic in those nine weeks i lost 68 pounds and got down to about 200 and I think my my weight at that was 232 which still was overweight but based on all the calculations they figure I was somewhere around 10 percent body fat so I'm like wow. didn't have a lot to lose at that point in time but it's hard to believe that yeah it's, it's the recruiter saying no to me 10 years earlier I still wound up doing what I wanted to do back then. And it just, life just circled me back around and put me back in the military. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad you did, man. Uh, that's something that I, I never discouraged anybody. You know, of course I was on recruiting duty for quite some time and, <laughs> you know, I, uh, that's what they wanted to do. I don't care what their as up score said, <laughs> you know, because that desire is not going to go away. Absolutely. Paul says, good morning, everyone. Elkie says, don't try coffee. You'll just get addicted to it. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> Dr. T.C. Fuller says, good morning, gents from South Carolina. Coin number 1620. William says, good morning, Rich. Will Parker, our good friend, is on out there Will. in Montana. Uh, Jamie says, go Army. Jeff Brown says, Marine Corps recruiters are mean. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Will Parker says, brother from another mother. Big Absolutely. Steve. Absolutely, Will. Uh, tell us about coaching. How did you get into coaching? Well, the coaching thing was, first of all, I am coin number 2003. So I have to, I, I have to get out, get that out there. Uh, the coaching thing was, it really started when I was in high school. The part of the program that my coach, coach Jones, um, I remember that coach, coach Paul Jones. I mean, he's passed since then, but um, he created a program in our school where the, if on varsity, one of the requirements was you had to coach one of the lower level help coach one of the lower level grades. So it could be like fifth grade or third grade or something where we did uh, like youth camps. The kids would come in and we'd work at those programs. And I really enjoyed working with kids. As I got older, I, when I was in college, I worked with some kids part time just, just to kill some time during school. And then I got to the working world. So once I hit the working world and I was a working professional, I was working in Wisconsin as a, uh, as a medical college, working as a research associate in a medical college. And one of the school, one of the local community centers was like, hey, we need a coach. And I was like, you know, it's 10 minutes from the house. What the heck? Let's go coach. So I started coaching then, got out or left. And at that point, shortly after I joined the Army, worked with my first duty station. I got to Fort Knox, the high school, one of the um, high schools there needed a, or middle school, excuse me, needed a coach. So I coached middle school basketball. Got transferred to Germany, PCS over to Germany, came back out. When I got back out, I did a few things career-wise, but I always wanted to go back to working with kids. I always wanted to go back to coaching. And when I went back to coaching, and this was probably about 12 years ago, it started where I was at a really emotionally, I wasn't at a good place. And 
I was like, what can I do to pour energy into something else? And kids working with um, high school students, um, teenagers, and, and has just always been something that I've had a passion for. And one of the schools that I sub, well, I was substitute teaching because with my business, I had a lot of time off during the day. One of my friends was a teacher and she's like, man, we're always short on subs. Is there any way you can sub? It's like, yeah, sure. No problem. I'll go do that. Wound up at a small school, um, West Michigan Academy of Environmental Science as a sub and went to the athletic director and said, hey, if you guys ever need somebody to just help out coaching, you know, I've got some time. Started coaching there. I started with the boys team and that was in 2009 and in 2002. 10 the girls team or at the end of that season the coach left and the girls team a couple of players came to me and said hey coach is there any way you'd be willing to come over and coach the girls team and i'm like dude i am not good with girls i curse i'm not politically correct i'm gonna get fired if i coach the girls team and they're like no no we want you and i told them i said well i'll make a deal with you if you guys get every player that's on the team this year that's planning on coming back next year if you get every one of them to say we want you then i'll coach and she and um i remember the girl's name was chelsea chelsea looked at me and she's like coach we're all here right now staring at you and the only person that's not here is sick and she's been asking you why you aren't coaching the girls team already so you know she's gonna be in so shout out to my girls at west michigan academy um those ladies know who they are. They got me back into coaching, but coaching girls specifically. And I've been coaching girls for since 2010. So it's just been, it's, it's more fun and more challenging than I ever imagined it would be. I've learned so much more about communication, especially and building relationships. Um, guys, you tell them see wall, hit wall. And they're like, all right, let me show you how tough I am. And they go hit wall. And the girls are like, well, why are we doing this? Make me to understand what's causing us to want to take that wall down. So and you explain to them why. And they're like, oh, okay, now that we understand why that wall should come down, let's go start building the wall, taking the wall down. So it's it's same, you know, there's not a lot different in coaching girls than guys. It's just getting the the language down. Yeah. It's a, I was going to say it's a little bit more nuanced, perhaps. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> let's welcome some folks onto the show. Nova says, good morning, everyone. Coin number 1960. John says, morning, Steve. American War Society. That means my dear friend, our dear friend, Mr. Mike Seeklander. Mr. On. Seeklander, good morning. He says, please like and share. And, he, and he's absolutely right. Thank you to the 24 folks that are joining us live. We got up to 30 a moment ago. Let's see if we can't break 30. I uh, says, please like and hit that share button. Uh, let's, we also have Jeremiah on morning. Coin number 2109 from Ohio is checking in. So um, we talked about, you know, coaching girls, and I'm going to unpack a little bit of that here in a moment because I want to ask you, Steve, what makes a good coach? And then then we'll dig into the firearms piece. But right now is how did you get into firearms, man? I, I can understand the progression that you your life has kind of took a little bit having spent time with you. But where did the guns come into play? The guns came into play um, when I was younger. I, I, I grew up in Detroit. Um, the if you've ever seen the movie Eight Mile with the Eminem movie, Eight Mile, that's literally the area that I grew up. My grandmother still lives in that area. Um, and growing up in that area, my parents, both of them were working parents. My parents are still together. They're 50, I think it's 55 years this year. Wow. Um, and I asked my dad, I'm like, Dad, how is it that you guys are making this thing work after 55 years? He's like, because we want to. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's simple enough. Um, but my dad moved us up to a rural farming town and I went from inner city Detroit, predominantly African-American. I think in my school, I don't remember a white student in my school, like in the entire school building. We then moved to a little town called Memphis, Michigan, where there was one, there wasn't many African-American students and most of us all knew each other from Detroit and we all kind of migrated, gradually migrated up there. So, when we were out in this farming area, my dad's like, well, son, you got to know how to use a gun. So here I am, 10, 12 years old. Dad takes the shotgun out and you know, we're shooting 22, shooting shotguns. And it was never a, a hide the guns thing. It was never a put the guns in the safe. It was always the here's what the guns are. Here's how they operate. Respect it. Understand it. Don't touch it without my permission. 
if you want to go shoot it, we'll set up a time. We'll go shoot it. If we, there's nothing going on, we'll do. So that was what was going on for my, for most of my life. Then fast forward, I'm, you know, helping um, kids out at the gun club. I'm fast forward. I'm, you know, in the military, I get out and I have friends that are trying to teach me how to shoot. And they're like, Hey, can you teach us how to shoot? And I'm like, yeah, sure. No problem. So it gradually worked that way until one day I was getting my concealed pistol license. And as I was getting my concealed pistol license, at the time I was working on taking some master's degree classes, I was working on um, being dad. I was working a full-time job. All this is going on. And I had one weekend. I was still in the National Guard. I had one. I just got off of AT and I had one weekend off for like the next six weeks. And my goal was to just simply go in, get my concealed carry class, go out, get my license. And the guys that were teaching the class literally were reading from the manual verbatim. And one guy would point his hand over and go, next slide, next slide, read, 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 next slide. And I'm thinking, there's so much more these guys could do. They've got a captive audience in Michigan. They're required to attend an eight-hour class. There's so much more these guys can do. So I started looking in the process to become an instructor. And a few short years later, I got my instructor certification. Initially, it was with the NRA. Then I switched over to the U.S. Concealed Carry Association. And here I am today. Cool. And if you're just joining us late, uh, you're, th my name is Rich Brown, co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society. And I've got Stephen Washington on this morning. And we were talking about uh, Stephen is, has helped us with our firearms instructor development course and is an amazing uh, firearms instructor. So I want to, and coach, by the way, I want to ask you, what makes a great firearms instructor? Really, obviously, you know, aside from the subject matter expert side of things, obviously you've got to know how to, what to teach, but also how to teach. One of the most frustrating things that I see as a instructor developer is those folks that believe and they think all they need to know is how to shoot a gun. And if you know the, I can get the guy to get the gun onto the paper. That's one aspect of it. But the other aspect of it, especially when you're talking about the legal implications, you're talking about the mindset, you're talking about um, the confrontation and the aftermath there's so much more to it. So the, there's three things that I think go into making a firearms instructor. One is obviously the, the knowledge about the subject matter. The second thing is being able to deliver that subject matter in a manner that keeps students engaged. And the third thing is the ability to pivot. And those three things, especially that ability to pivot, if I, know the content. If I know the way to present it, but I don't recognize when my students aren't getting it, or I don't recognize when my students need something else, that's where that is. And that's that connection between the instructor and the student. You've heard me say this several times today as the connection as a coach. Same thing as a connection as an instructor. If you can recognize what your students are needing at the time that they have that moment while you're in class, and you can change directions as they need to, and then just make it fun. If it's, I, I see so many instructors that are like, I'm here to talk to you about how to shoot a gun, and they look like they're miserable. Who wants to take a class from somebody that looks like they're miserable? I mean, it's enjoy it, have fun. There's so many that are mechanical, and it's the first thing you've just got to do is, you know, after those three things, is just have the passion and have fun with it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, it's just like if, if you were going to teach me how to shoot a basketball and you can shoot a basketball really good, but you can't walk me through the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. Are you doing me any good? Exactly. Now, in truth, you know, there, there's some uh, and Mike Seeklander talks about this, too. You know, the idea that you have to be able to demo in front of students. And absolutely. There's a lot of uh, biology and psychology mm -hmm. behind the fact that you have mirror neurons in your brain. Mm -hmm. And when I when I watch Steve Washington shoot a basketball, mm -hmm. it's. I'm making neural connections up here, but at the same time, if you're not connecting with me emotionally, right. right. And you don't have the ability, like you said, I think that's a great word, Steve, to pivot. 
and see when I'm really not getting it. And maybe there's six students getting it, but maybe three aren't. Mm -hmm. And the ability to pivot and ad address them uh, is something I've seen you do incredibly well. Thank you. The, uh, the thing that when I'm teaching students and, you know, you re referencing the shooting a basketball thing, you know, when you're coaching, you know that every one of your players needs something different to be where they're at. And I look at my classes the same way when I'm in my classes and it's an eight hour class and we're having the discussions, different students are in different points in their journey to getting their concealed pistol license. Some students you have come in. I mean, I had one, one of the classes, I had a uh, retired army sergeant major who was actually a sergeant major at the sniper Academy. And I'm thinking, what's this guy taking this class for? This guy knows more than I'll probably ever recognize. And he was in class. And then in that same class, I had somebody who was just picking up a handgun for the first time. And they are the only time they've been, ex ex their only experience with a handgun is I saw it on TV. I'm here. I'm renting one from you guys. You're going to teach me how to shoot it. So you're trying to balance that end of the spectrum where you've got, you know, retired Sergeant major, so many tours done this trains people how to shoot person who's only seen one on TV. How do you balance that? So you have to do a lot of individualized coaching through the process. And as you're doing that, I'm going through trying to think this Sergeant major spending X amount of dollars taking my class. This first time student is taking X amount of dollars in, the, in my class. How can I make this class where both of them feel that they got a value? And that requires me coaching one direction, coaching another direction towards the middle, coaching towards the other side and recognizing when those points are going to occur. And as they occur, hitting those folks, picking them up along the journey so that everybody gets to that certification destination together. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. And we've talked about this, of course, in a class that you're taking students on a journey, right? Uh, and, and again, not leaving any of them behind and not, I think I want to pivot a little bit to use, okay. to use your word, um, to talk about everybody has a different relationship with firearms. Mm -hmm. like, like the woman that came to the class, you know, what is the context in which she sees this use? Is it a defensive mm -hmm. context? Is she just wants to learn how to use it so she can teach a grandchild? I mean, we, we don't necessarily know what the relationship mm -hmm. is with firearms. Um, and, th and that's what I want to ask you. The question, I guess, is what is the, in your opinion, what is the purpose of, of our enshrined Second Amendment? Uh, and then I also want to say, could, and I, I wouldn't plan on asking this question, but when you brought up the point that, point that you moved from Eight Mile to Memphis, and, and you are now you're out in the country, and, and now you're shooting guns maybe for the first time, mm -hmm. um, what is the African-American experience with the Second Amendment? Because I think it might be a little different than maybe mine from East Tennessee, mm -hmm. or not. Tell me. Okay. All right. So let's start first with the uh, the first question as far as – refresh my memory on the first one because I really yeah, – The purpose wanted, of the Second Amendment, okay. Steve. All right. Great. So my perception of the purpose of the Second Amendment is two aspects of it. One is our founding fathers recognized that had it not been for – average citizen owning firearms had england been the only ones with firearms our country wouldn't be where we're at today we'd probably still be subjects of england and our founding fathers recognized that the average person owning firearms for one way of life self-defense but more significantly if our government for some reason loses touch with reality like england did and decides to tax us without representing us. I mean, when you look at the Declaration of Independence, there are, I think it was 26 different reasons our founding our, that they declared, this is why we are not, we are declaring our independence. We've told you what our problems are. We've told you what our concerns are. Our government wasn't listening anymore. England wasn't listening to us anymore. And they're like, you know what? It's time for us to take, a, take responsibility for our own selves. And set up our own country. If you're not going to listen to us, we're going to form our own country. And we look at this and 
one of the questions in my social studies class that I posed was, and it's one of the first questions I ask in my U.S. history classes, if our founding fathers acted the way that they did today, would they be considered founding fathers or would they be considered terrorists? Terrorists. Yeah. So, so when we look at that, it's like, I, I pose that question, but I think it, like I said, it was twofold, one for way of life issues, hunting, survival, but the other one was to keep our government in check. I mean, I think there's other countries out there that in the past have said, you know what, hey, you know, what if we were to look at invading America and taking over America? And the perception of America is that everybody's got 25 AR-15s in the closet, handguns coming out of, you know, falling through the doors. So while a country may want to come and take us over, and they're like, yeah, we've got these weapons, but they've got, you know, 300 million people in the country and 295 million of them are armed. The other 5 million are under the age of two. You know, there's just that perception that we've got guns all <clears> over <throat> the place. Okay. So that second question on what was it like and the relationship of the African-American, what was it like moving from eight, eight mile, mile. <laughs> To Memphis and Memphis to give people a perspective on it. Um, at the time I moved there, there wasn't a traffic light in town. There was wow. just a flashing red light, red light one direction, yellow light the other direction in the middle of downtown. And everybody just, you know, everybody knows everybody. It's that small a town. I think the my high or my my school system K through twelve had roughly a thousand students in it. So that puts things kind of in perspective. My graduating class was forty seven. Wow. So what it was like as I grew up there, going from Detroit to, to Memphis, two words come to mind. First one is culture shock. Or that, actually, those are the two words, culture and shock. It was a unique perspective. I, uh, my first day there, um, a kid called me a name. It was a racial slur, and I punched him in the mouth and knocked his teeth out. And... That kid later on, we're friends now. He later on grew up to be a Marine at our five year or 10 year anniversary. He's talking to me and he mentioned something about it. He's like, dude, I was so wrong doing that to you guys, doing that to you. And I'm like, hey, no problem. You know, I understand we do things that we don't agree with. Now, as far as the African American community relationship with firearms, that is a, that's a wide question. Um, yeah. Well, specifically, Steve, let me let me okay. pigeonhole you a little bit, and okay. then you can t you can expound okay. and unpack it. Is the relationship to the Second Amendment? Okay. Uh, because I, I don't know that you know I, I don't know that. Well, I'll, anyway, I'll let you take it, and okay. then we'll go from there. All right. Okay. So the relationship to the Second Amendment one is most African Americans believe that while we have a right to um, bear arms, and while people should be able to do that, there's kind of twofold. One is, you know, well, the internal violence in the African-American community towards one another is one separate aspect, but let's just talk about from the legal aspect of it. Because if you look at this country's history, a lot of the gun control laws were put in place during the 1800s to keep African-Americans from owning firearms because they thought, especially in some of the Southern states, the impression was if we give these folks guns after we've been oppressing them for hundreds of years, how are they going to react to it? How are they going to respond to us? And it was often done where if someone, if a African-American needed a gun, then they might get sold a gun, but it wasn't the best gun, even if they could afford it or the gun that they got, even though it was not a quality, it was a functional firearm. The price that they would charge would be, higher than what they would charge um, another white citizen that were to own the firearm. So there's that balancing act as we look at history. How is it that what's going on in the black community today related to violence towards one another? And how does that relate to gun violence and gun ownership? And as I mentioned, part of this is Yes, most African Americans, if you talk to them, feel that yes, we do as American citizens have a right to own firearms, but many of them just aren't comfortable with it because of more so a function of lack of familiarity. There's not been a lot of your typical education in the African American community about firearms that you see, which 
that you see going on with uh, the NRA coming into the African American community or different organizations coming into the community and promoting gun ownership, promoting um, responsible um, training on that. And that's one of my missions that I personally am trying to do, trying to uh, impact, um, you know, kind of just to kind of shift gears. The U.S. Concealed Carry Association is partnering with several organizations, for example, the, Nas the NAGA, National African American Gun, Gun Owners Association, to increase the education, the educational efforts in the African American community around firearms ownership. And as a result of that, we're starting to see more training, more trainers, more facilities, more ownership, or gun ownership opportunities occurring in the African American community. And it's not being shunned it's actually being promoted and being emphasized so that we can take responsibility for educating ourselves and educating the community about gun ownership so there's been a significant shift in the last probably the last i'd have to say the last decade it's really when it started to take an effort and move forward yeah and i think that's a good thing i it really didn't occur to me that there was a strange relationship between the African-American community and maybe the, the two way community mm -hmm. uh, until I've talked to some of our students. And uh, one of the which was in the class in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was saying that he brought a, an African-American firearms trainer. I can't remember who it was. And it was he was having a hard time renting a range. And I'm like, what, what's what do you mean? What you're having a problem? You didn't have insurance. He's like, no, the, the fact that we were going to have a a large group of African Americans with guns that just made people unsettled in this in this small community, and I'm, and I just was stunned, absolutely yeah. stunned by that. And, and that's that's the other challenge is is when you think about traditionally where the concentration of African Americans are, it tends to be in the cities where most people don't own the land. Traditionally, we haven't had the resources to build the facility so that we can do the training. So it's hard when you don't have a place to shoot. <laughs> to learn how to shoot. And so you're then forced to go to a portion of the community that may or may not be excited about a bunch of black folk running around owning guns, you know? So, so it's that challenge that that double-edged sword is access to resources, not, you know, looking at desire, but when you have the desire to do it, you then have to have the means to be able to do it. And you mentioned that USCCA, which of course, you know, you are now a field training specialist for health and defense, which is a service provider for USCCA. What, what kind of steps are they taking if you could be, and then what is the purpose of USCCA and where are they heading? Steve? Okay. So let me kind of address the purpose of the USCCA. The purpose of the USCCA simply put is saving lives. I'm actually at the office right now. I'm usually not at USCCA headquarters. So I'm, I'm in a room where there's glass, window and people are walking by and they use they aren't used to seeing me here so every time i walk by you'll see me kind of glance up and it's somebody waving at me um but simply put it saving lives our goal is to just educate and ensure individuals so that they can be their family's first responder S with that being the emphasis is simply saving lives the USCCA is like, we're not trying to say we're only going to save white lives or we're only going to save African-American lives. Or we're only going to save Hispanic lives. They want to give all Americans the opportunity to exercise that Second Amendment right. And most importantly, get training to become not just gun owners, but responsible gun owners. There's so many folks out there. I mean, we had, I think the last statistic I saw was 10 million first time gun owners in this country. And you can't tell me that all 10 of them are highly qualified and competent with the firearm when they bought it. So there's that disconnect that um, I read another statistic. And again, I, I apologize for not knowing the source, but it's out of these first time gun owners, only approximately 10% of them are actually going to go out and get professional training. And when you think about that disconnect, you've got this large pile of individuals that don't know how to handle a firearm efficiently and effectively. And they're being asked to be their own first responder because the reason they got it was not because it was cool, but they got it because they had a genuine fear most often. Um, and now they're saying, hey, you're going to have to potentially use this to protect yourself, but we're not going to get trained. 
And part of that is the instructor community's fault because some of our instructors are, you know, I look at, you know, you have some folks that come from the military and they're thinking, you know, the knife hand, you are going to do how to shoot and you're going to do, you know, I mean, if you've been military, you know where I'm coming from. But we kind of, as instructors, have to take the edge off and make it so that we're receptive to everyone, first-time gun owners especially, because those first-time gun owners eventually become experienced gun owners, which become highly skilled gun owners, which potentially is also our next generation of instructors. And those are also the folk that we need to continue the Second Amendment push so that we exercise those rights and we continue to have the ability to exercise those rights. Every time we see an irresponsible act by a gun owner, we're in effect loading the anti-gun owners' guns so that they can use them against us. So we've got to, as a community, focus on making sure our folks get the proper education. And that's really what the USCCA is really focusing on, is how can we get more people trained so that they can protect themselves, so that they can get the education that they want, give them more confidence, um, make them more comfortable if they're first-time gun owners, and have them continuing that training journey. Yeah, that's great, man. Uh, let's let's. I'm gonna unpack some of that, but before I do, let's welcome some folks onto the show. Steve, Chris is on. Says good morning from Mississippi. Donald is on. Says good morning from Occupied Virginia. He's coin number thirteen seventy six. Amanda says, and he is a great teacher and instructor. Thank you, Amanda. You're correct. Jamie you. says Steve is really great at identifying each student's specific needs so he can make them comfortable and help them learn. Wow. Before I go any further, let's unpack that. Make Why is making a student comfortable, especially in firearms, so important, Steve? You know, it really boils down to having them be comfortable enough so that if they have a question or there's something that they're not connecting with, if you create a comfortable environment, then that student can, one, is be open emotionally to receiving the information. But when there's something that there's a disconnect, because when we talk about learning, we're talking about going from the known to the unknown. And you've got to create those neural pathways and get that connection. And the more, you know, I, I liken it to walking through a, a, a jungle. The first time you walk through a jungle, jungle, you've got to kind of take the machete and you're hacking your way through. And eventually you get to that point where you get to your destination. When you come back through there, you, ha- you want to take the same way back so you can hack that path. And it's easier treading through there the second time and the third time and the fourth time. The problem is, is if you don't create that comfortable environment where if a student has a disconnect, I liken that to having a machete that has a dull edge. They're not going to be able to get through it as easily. They're not going to understand it. So what I do by creating a comfortable environment for them to learn in is it's basically allowing them to sharpen that machete so that they hack for a little while. And what happens? You dull that edge again. You ask another question. You get a deeper understanding. You're sharpening that machete again. You can keep going through there. And when students are comfortable with, quote, unquote, the sharpening the machete process or asking the question process, and you welcome them, you say, hey, if you need to have your iron sharpened, let's sharpen your iron. If you need to have something clarified, ask it. Let's get that clarified. Because if you are here and you can't move past this roadblock that you have here, then eventually you're just going to be like, forget it. Why am I doing this? Let me ask you this question is because I know, you know, you've helped facilitate our FIDC fire instructor course is, is comfort somewhat synonymous with making your students feel safe or am I reading too much into that? I would agree with you. Um, there's the physical safety aspect of it. If you've got something, you're, I mean, you're handling a firearm. If you've got a first time user and they see you walk up and you pull this gun out and you start waving it around, like it's just an inanimate object, which, you know, we know that if the gun has no bullets in it, we know that if the gun is the slide is locked open, you know, it's safe to handle, but who feels comfortable having a gun pointed at them? I don't. I've owned a gun store. I've been teaching people to shoot for years. Every time a gun gets pointed at me, even if I know it's unloaded, I'm like, whoa, whoa, hang on. Let's slow this down. So you've one got to create that physical safety aspect of it. But if you don't have that emotional safety aspect of it, if you don't have that, you know, 
psychologically, I can come to grips with what's happening. Learning slows, if not stops, because we've all seen somebody do something stupid in just a class or say something that um, says something. I remember I was in a class with a professor and an African-American said something, an African-American student said something, and the professor actually used the N-word in class. What? Shut the entire class down. Every, you know, people got up, they walked out. Other people stayed there not knowing what to do. The whole class basically froze. And this was a huge lecture hall. And I remember that. And even when that professor tried to take control back of the class, there was such a learning block by those people that remained base all of his credibility was just completely undercut and you're thinking i don't want to learn from this guy you know i know i was thinking that i dropped the class and i literally went to the university and said you're going to give me a refund for this class or you're going to get me into another class that i can continue taking even though i'm well past the refund deadline and the university was like yeah we got to look into this and they removed the professor from the class and put another put another professor in that class so again, it becomes a function of you've got to have that environment created where people feel emotional safety and they feel like they will be protected and respected, and that will facilitate greater learning and deeper understanding. Well, I think physical and emotional safety. I mean, you know, I, I, I think they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, Gerald says, how did you get involved with USCCA? Okay. okay. In 2012, the USCCA launched their certified or their their curriculum, and when they launched their curriculum in 2012 for their uh, concealed carry home defense fundamentals curriculum, I was an instructor for another organization, and I saw this curriculum, and I like I just got to take get my hands on it, take a look at it. If I like it, I'll do it. If I don't like it, I won't do it. So I just ordered it, it came through, it was multimedia based, it had videos in it, it had those PowerPoint slides, very detailed, very descriptive. And we're like, wow, this is literally the best curriculum that I've seen. And this was having worked with another organization and taught probably 3000 students at this point in time. And I finally said, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. So I started out with them in as an affiliate instructor, which means you weren't you hadn't take a certified instructor course. They just gave you the materials and you taught it however you wanted to teach it. They later eliminated that program. So anyone who was utilizing our curriculum had to be a certified instructor. I then became a certified instructor. I want to say in 2014, I believe it was um, my my time kind of blurs together 2013, 2014, somewhere in there. Um, I attended the certified instructor class. They liked the way that I presented myself, the way that I conducted myself and asked if I'd be interested in being a training counselor. I became a training counselor in, I want to say 2015. And in 2015, that meant I became, be, had the ability to train people to become instructors. Since then, I've been working with them on a number of projects, a number of programs. And I joke with them, I just got hired in, in, July of this year. And I, I joke around here is it's been an eight year job interview. So it's the longest job interview I've ever had. Um, talk about doing the job for a long time before I actually got the job that I have now. So it's been fun. Um, I really love it. I'm glad to be a part of the team. And the greatest thing or the funnest thing that I love about being at Delta Defense is the culture. The culture is amazing. Um, the only thing I can explain it, it's almost, you know, I joke, I, it, I won't say it's cult-like, but it's very, you know, the camaraderie that you have with your military friend. I mean, if anybody who's been in the military knows, there's times that you have days where you're like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. But overall, you remember the relationships. You recognize the goals, all of those things. And it's just, I have fun. Every time I come to headquarters, I have fun. It's just tremendous connections. Well, you know, you and I have talked about this, Steve. I, I, I think it's awesome that you're in the position you are because the impact you can have uh, covering the vast swath of territory that you're responsible for is going to be incredible, man. Tim, Tim says so many great thoughts in there. Uh, 
Tony says, apparently we need F-15s and nukes now in regard to our second. Amendment. Yeah, I, I agree with you, man. I've got my F-15 on order. So uh, I'm doing an online uh, pilot training for my F-15. Fantastic. John says, as a USCCA and CCNHD instructor, it's great to uh, start students on their journey to be a responsible armed citizen. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. William. William says, I'm still surprised at this day and age, people still feel that way. I'm not, I'm not sure. Gerald says, do you think over the last few years, politics has tried to stir up one race against another? Is it sorry, off topic? I don't think it's off topic. I can address that. Okay, please. <laughs> um, I think it is not necessarily a politics thing. I think it is more so a you know, misunderstanding or a difference of a perspective. Um, Rich, we've had this conversation before, and I have this conversation with everyone I know. For example, the school that I was teaching social studies in until I took this position was a predominantly white school. I was the only African-American in the school building, in the school district, um, from a staff perspective. Um, and I'm in West Michigan, which is predominantly Republican territory. So here I am, a kid that grew up in inner city Detroit, moved to a farming community. Now, you know, done time in the military, been uh, vice president of investments at a major bank. So I've got all of these things that are just coming together. And I decide suddenly, hey, let's go ahead and teach social studies. Let's talk about government. Let's talk about current event issues. Let's talk about all of these things. And the thing that I've always stressed is understanding. There's a reason why people do what they do. And a lot of times we just assume it's ignorance. We assume that it's, um, you know, they don't get it or they don't understand. And a lot of times in this soundbite society that we have, the phrase that I use with my students is you guys are expecting oven baked results on a microwave timeline mm -hmm. and it just doesn't happen. And when people don't get the reaction that they want, they start trying to think of some other reason. But what we have not seen in general is a movement or a push towards understanding. So as I'm working in this community and as I'm teaching these kids and it's like, you know, I have my values and my values are, you know, I'll, I'll put my political views out there. I'm not Democrat. I'm not Republican. I want a government that respects me, period. I vote for who I think is the best candidate, regardless of party. I look at the issues, the issues I align with, I vote for that guy. The issues I don't align with, I don't vote for that guy, period. It's that simple. Some people just aren't willing to do the research. They assume if I vote for this guy, he represents this party. These are his views. These are his values. I'm not voting for that party or I am voting for this party. When I talk with these kids, I stress them. If there's something that you don't understand or you don't agree with, learn about it. If it's important enough to affect our country, you probably want to do a little research. Don't research just one side of the issue. If all your news you're getting is from CNN, 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 and then you're not looking at Fox News. You're not looking at MSNBC. You're not looking at Breitbart. You're not looking at all of everybody that's out there and then forming an opinion and then talking with people that might be experiencing that lifestyle or experiencing that concern. Then you're only getting a portion of the understanding. If you only have one side of the issue, of course, your views are going to be skewed to that one side of the issue. You know, we hear so many people talk about, well, why is there so much African-American versus African-American violence? Why isn't the black community taking care of this? And I mean, a lot of this stems from back when the 1860s, right when slavery ended, if I had an issue, if as a black man, I had an issue with somebody that was white, if I took it to law enforcement, nine times out of 10, I shouldn't say nine times, more like 99 times out of 100, they by default sided with the white guy. If I had an issue with an African-American, a lot of the law enforcement were like, ah, it's not our community. You guys figure it out for yourselves. So if for generation upon generation upon generation, 
African Americans can't trust law enforcement, what continuously happens? Anytime law enforcement gets involved, what do we say as a, as a, as a group? We don't want to deal with you guys. You guys are all wrong. You guys are this. If, you know, and again, this is a perspective that I have from talking with, you know, one, doing research, um, going through college, understanding this, and people are like, well, you know, college, they're all liberals at college. Well, you know what? They may be liberal, but they do know a little bit about researching stuff. And I learned how to research things, learned how to find information, and learned how to look at multiple sources. As this occurs, as I mentioned, African Americans have this perspective where law enforcement, they feel like law enforcement for generations, not the last five years, not the last 10 years, generations. What we're seeing is that with technology, I can put something on Facebook sooner than even if person next to me calls 911, I can have a thousand views before law enforcement, law enforcement arrives in five minutes. True. And this is a way for me to capture the things that I've been saying is happening. Law enforcement shows up, they pull me over. Okay, let me get video because I can get the video out and as it really happens, it happens. We saw that with George Floyd. We saw that with so many other cases that are out there. Um, and ultimately speaking, we've got to all come to an understanding where we understand that if you're not in agreement with the other position, you need to do a better job in understanding. I'm going to finish this thought with this one statement. When I talk to my students, the thing that I tell them is this, the best way to crush someone in a debate, in a debate is to understand their perspective better than they do. Understand their case better than they do. When you understand their case better than they do, they can't argue it. You've yeah. got the data, you've got the research. So anyways, I'll get off my soapbox. No, that's great. I mean, that's that's Sun Tzu, right? The art of war. You mm -hmm. know yourself and know your enemy and you exactly. should clear the outcome of a thousand battles. That's spot on. Gregory says, good morning, all. Coin number 1928 from Rhode Island. And Gregory's going to be a guest on the show. Looking forward to that. Great. Gerald has an outstanding question. I want to come back to that. Let's welcome a few more folks on. Adam is on from Jonesboro, Georgia. Coin number 878. Wow. My good friend Memphis Beach is on. It says, good morning from Memphis, Tennessee. Coin number yes. 1751. Abigail says T-Rex equals the best instructor ever. <laughs> Abby, I love you, girl. She Abby's one of my students, and she refers to me as T-Rex because I'm her small arms guy. Mm -hmm. But we also, as instructors, uh, we don't want to adopt that T-Rex when we're teaching either. Exactly. <laughs> William says, uh, I'm talking about race and firearms ownership and training. Yeah, yeah, we just kind of got on to that. That's good stuff. Uh, Will Parker says, Kukumu, I guess, uh, clear, yeah. complete, mutual understanding when you're trying mm -hmm. to understand yeah. the other person. I have to understand them. Mm -hmm. I have to make sure that they understand what they just said. And then if we have a mutual understanding together, then we can move forward. And mm -hmm. to your point about, you said something a moment ago, Steve, that um, I'll, I, I'll use a personal anecdote. Mm -hmm. I, when I was a bouncer, we needed to hire another one. So a friend of mine who was a sergeant at the School of Infantry with me, he was also a fellow Tennessean. This happened to be African-American. So mm -hmm. I brought him into the club. And there was one other bouncer that happened to be black. And when uh, my buddy Campbell got there, the other black bouncer addressed him immediately as, hey, my N-word. Mm -hmm. And my friend went ballistic. Mm -hmm. I thought they were going to come to blows. And he's like, Rich, you better talk to this guy. And I, I'm like, I didn't understand what's going on. He's like, you're from Tennessee, man. You know that people use that word to hurt us there. Mm -hmm. So it, it, again, everybody has a different relationship mm -hmm. with those things. And from this Ollie, who happened to be from the inner mm -hmm. city, it was a term of endearment and affection. Right. My friend, uh, Sergeant Campbell, it was a, it was always going to be a hurt right. slur. So uh, I think people have to understand where everybody's coming from and the context with which they perceive certain things. Okay. And you're absolutely correct. To Ali, it was, a, like you mentioned, a term of endearment. To Campbell, it was a racial slur and a very derogatory term. So let me kind of unpack that a little bit. Why is it that African-Americans are using that term when they address one another? And a lot of times there's power in claiming ownership of the negative. And one of the reasons that many African-Americans, you know, you hear about it in rappers, you hear about it in 
in poetry, you hear about it in different uh, individuals, just friends, is if I own that word and I use that word the way that I feel it is empowering to myself and my community, then there's a greater, I'm protecting myself from that, from the meaning of that word. But again, if the other person that I have no idea who you are, I don't know anything about you, you're using that word. Now it becomes a, wait a second now, you cross that line and do not cross that line. And it's simply a function of, you know, I've heard, I've, I've got friends that are gay and they've called each other in effect, the F word in their community. Um, I've got, you know, friends that are from different ethnic groups and all of them at some level have taken some power back of a negative term or a negative word and use that to empower themselves. But again, that is one of those things where, you know, it's kind of like a brother, you know, a family. I can call my brother something that nobody else can, but if you call them that, I'm up in your face. That's right. you know, military, I can dog Marines all day, every day. And they're like, oh, Army, right? And I'm like, yeah. But if somebody else dogged a Marine that wasn't a Marine, I'd get in their face. If they weren't military, I'd get in their face. No, no, no. You're not. I can call a Marine a crayon eater because they're going to call me any number of other yeah. <laughs> terms. But they, it's it's that brotherhood that you have. And that's where that taking ownership of the n-word comes from is i can reestablish what that term means to me in my community but since you're not a member of my community you know you're not there yet we as a society are not there yet yeah like i i've told you before you know i come from a long line of uh mm -hmm. illiterate uh, folks from the hills of east tennessee and and one of the words that that is somewhat hurtful you know is hillbilly especially mm -hmm. when it's used in derogatory like right. my my dad said he went up north and people heard his accent and behind his back would be saying dirty hillbilly. And my mm. dad didn't, didn't take mm. well to that. So, but you know, amongst our, our each other, maybe hillbilly <laughs> is a term of endearment. Right. Uh, let's see here. We have some comments. Memphis uh, says, got to jump. Fantastic show. Thanks rich and Steve TC Fuller. Dr. TC Fuller says we need more moral conversation Absolutely. in the public space. The idea Absolutely. that I will look for fallacy in what I espouse and the truth in what my opponents say before I get fired up is one that we should encourage might make for more civil disagreement rather than violence. Wow. Well said. Oh, wow. That's, I mean, that's, that's deep looking for the fallacy in my belief system before I look for the truth in other people's that's, that's deep. Yeah. TC is a very learned man. He, yeah, he, he is. does have I've, a doctorate. Yeah. I'll just say I've seen TC speak with you on several occasions i've i've followed him um and some other things and i mean i tc man keep doing what you're doing yeah no kidding tony says wondering if mr washington is familiar with dustin solomon and building shooters and does he incorporate their neuroscience learning into his program i don't I, i'm not familiar with dustin solomon but my background is i have my degrees in health i was planning on being a doctor or a uh, athletic trainer so i really did a lot of work studying anatomy physiology um you know plus my time related to just the science behind new learning especially when it comes to the physical aspect of it as a as a coach and as doing performance work so a lot of those things I'm sure there's probably a lot of similarities in the science just in general, because the science is the science. Um, but uh, my background has been mostly in physical and performance science and then um, mental health psychology. So because of that, I incorporate a lot of those ideals into the training that I use. Yeah. And just, just for the listener that may not know, I, actually it's ironic that he brings it up because I'm having Dustin Solomon on the show uh, coming up this coming Monday morning. So if, if you want to hear about the science of building shooters, uh, check us out Monday, folks. Uh, we'll have a great show for you, August the 2nd, 0730 Central Standard Time. But in that note, you know, you were, uh, I can tell by the way that, you know, having you know worked with you for quite a while now, you were a salesman before mm. you became a teacher and a coach. And I think, uh, if I'm fair to say, I don't know, we've never talked about it. Do you you appear to use a lot of your salesmanship in your instructing and teaching. Am I wrong in saying that? You're absolutely right. Um, but 
I'll actually flip that around and say, as a salesman, I was more of an educator. Gotcha. The, yep. you know, the, the, what's the old adage, the uh, first profession or the oldest profession. And as Zig Ziglar likes to say, even before the oldest profession occurred, there was a sale involved. That's right. um, so my thought has always been, if I present the, if I find out where a student is at and I meet them there, then it's not hard to bring them along on the journey. So I don't have to sell them per se, if I can get to their, where they're at and meet them. If I'm trying to sell them and I'm selling and I'm selling and I'm presenting this and I'm presenting this and just throwing all this stuff at them, then eventually they're just going to be like, you know, they're going to shut down. So my goal has always been, no matter what I've done from financial planning, from teaching is find out where the student is at, pick them up on the journey and let's all get the destination together. That's that to me is more powerful than selling. That's connecting and sharing. And when you have that, that's when you have the student that comes back. I mean, I have students that I haven't seen in five years that'll call me up and say, hey, I took a class with you five years ago. I'm up for renewal. What do I got to do to renew? And I'm just their gun guy. Yeah. Um, and I'm their gun, their gun trainer. And I get referrals constantly from people that are on the other side of the state, three hours away. I, I can't tell you the number of times I have people that drive three hours to sit in my basic class. And I'm like, why are you doing? Oh, you know, it made my daughter feel so welcome. You made, my son said, you're the best guy. I said, your class was fun. Your class was entertaining. And they learned a lot. And I'm like, okay, great. I don't think I'm worth a three hour drive for some of my classes. Others of my class, I think I'm worth a 10 hour drive. But for my basic shooting class, you know what? I can recommend somebody for you so that you don't have to drive all the way across. I enjoy the fact that you're there. I'll get to know you. I want to appreciate you. But a three-hour drive for a basic class with me, you know, and there's a lot of people out there that are saying I'm being humble or I'm being, you know, I'm not giving myself a pat on the back. I know when I need to give myself a pat on the back. I'm comfortable with giving myself a pat on the back. But you just have to recognize where's the value. I would rather a student save the time drive to somebody um and when i drive to when they drive somebody closer with them maybe they can establish a relationship with a good instructor that's over there and they can continue to connect and they can spend less on transporting back and forth to see me and more time on getting more training right. with a quality instructor there yeah and you know I, I love the way you answer that question because i felt the same way as a recruiter man mm -hmm. I'm not selling some kids so much as I'm listening to them mm -hmm. and I'm understanding what they're trying to accomplish in life and where they want to go. And maybe the Marine Corps is the right vehicle to help get them there. Uh, and I, I like that approach. And we talked about this, you know, too, like the, the uh, Jordan Belford Wolf of wall street, sell me this pin <laughs> really has more to do with, do they have a need? You know, what mm -hmm. is the listening for the language of needs of your student? What are they, what are they trying to, accomplish what is the context in which they're trying to get there so if you take that educator approach instead of like i'm a really sharp salesman i've got mm -hmm. the gift of gab i'm spitting platinum everywhere i go well you're probably not listening to your students and listening to the language and needs that's my opinion i agree with you 100 percent. yeah uh, greg says good morning from texas he is coin number 2060 he says late to the show but really enjoying it uh tc fuller says i will keep it on if you do sir Perfect. Johnny says your confidence, enthusiasm, and intelligence sells itself. My brother, Jeff says, I am doing really good with the mute button this morning. I am really trying. <laughs> I haven't screwed it up yet, but it's still early. <laughs> but uh, Steve, I know we've only got a few minutes left, so I want to really use your time. Well, I want to ask you brother, uh, having seen the lawlessness of 2020 and then seen what happened at the Capitol on January the 6th, where do you perceive all this lawlessness is going, my friend? Wow. You're the first person to actually ask me that as far as where it's going. Um, I know you got a crystal ball, so tell yeah, us where it's oh, going. As I look into your <laughs> eyes. Um, what uh, my frustration, I'll share my frustration with it and what I think needs to happen um, rather than where it's going. First of all, where it's going is if we don't get a handle on the device of this that's occurring in this country, it's going to rip it apart, period, end of statement. As far as my frustration with it is, again, this boils back to lack of understanding on both sides. 
Democrats, Republicans, black, white, tall, short, you know, fat, skinny, whatever you want to call it. When we're not understanding one another's perspective, what each other's needs are, what each other's concerns are, then as a country, we can't move forward. We've got a history, you know, it, it, I'll, I'll, all right, I'm going to talk about the CRT, the uh, race theory concept. As a, as a teacher, I'll address that, as, especially as a history social studies teacher. CRT is critical race yeah. theory, right? Yeah, critical race theory. I couldn't, I couldn't think of the first word. So mm -hmm. um, critical race theory in school. Here's what I want rather than critical race theory or rather than what we currently have. I want a comprehensive history program, one that includes the negative things that has happened in this country and the positive things that happened in this country. Am I in favor of the statues by anyone that has done anything that's been racist taken down? You know, at one point in time, we felt there was some value in what was being done, but I would also like the other side of that perspective told. When you try to whitewash and just eliminate theories or eliminate history, you know, we've all knows what happened when those that eliminate or those that don't understand history are destined or doomed to repeat it. I think what we need to do is just have a more comprehensive approach to it. If we take a more comprehensive look at this and recognize this was the negative things that we've done in this country, this is now the positive things that we have to say about this country. As we look at both of them, I think we can, those things that we want to keep, we can enhance. Those things that we want to not have highlighted, we can address those things and figure out how to move on. Um, at Delta Defense, we have a system called IDS, Identify, Discuss, Solve. We have, as a society, we have very few things that we identify the problem, but we don't want to discuss or we don't want to solve this in a mature and responsible manner. We want to identify it and whine and complain and moan about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I taught in my, in my classroom, I told my students, I'm like, you cannot complain about something unless you're willing to hear the bad that goes with it. And as they hear the bad that goes with it, it's like, okay, now that we've figured out what it is, let's not spend too much time. Now that we have an understanding, let's figure out how we move forward. You know, a student's failing a class. You don't just go, hey, you're stupid and move on. What do you do? Hey, let's figure out where there's some deficiencies. Is it something, is it the way that I'm teaching? Is it the, every student I had that failed, I tried to figure out where I didn't connect with that student, where I didn't meet them. And unfortunately, because there's, quote, unquote, no money in discussing things, there's no benefit to discussing things as far as this, you know, from a financial perspective in the society. A lot of times we don't want to discuss things. And more importantly, here's the big thing is I don't want to know that I'm wrong. And once I. I have something that there's a disconnect that says what I've been believing in for the last 51 years on this planet is not the healthiest thing or not the right thing. There's that disconnect. There's that pain that people have when they're finding out that they're wrong. And then I now have to go, oh, my gosh, not only was I wrong, but the other side was right. The, what's the old phrase? There's their side, my side, and the truth lies somewhere in the middle. The problem is we can't recognize, or we have difficulty as a society recognizing that my side ain't 100% right. Yep. Their side ain't 100% right. We've got to figure out where the compromises and occur. And somehow or another, we lost the ability to compromise as a country until we get that back and understand, yes, there are some things that need to be done on my side that I have to give on. There's some things that the other side has to give on. You know, we've heard the both sides of Congress, you know, Obama was trying to put judges in and what, what happened? Oh, we don't want, we don't want Obama's judges to be in because they're too liberal. What's happening. You know, what happened when Trump was in, everything got pushed through all these folks got in. Now what's happening that Biden's in. Oh, we can't have Biden come in there. We can't have him put his stuff in place because it's too liberal. You know, if Trump had gotten in and the Democrats were in place right now, we would see that still that divisiveness. I've told people, as long as we have a two-party system, I want to see two out of three houses or 
two out of the three branches or segments controlled by a split. I want to see Republicans have some, Democrats have some, and I don't care who's in the third one because you at least force the discussion. Now there's no discussion either. You're going to buy my end or you're going to get out. And we don't have discussion. That's what's frustrating me more than anything else. But yeah, and I could go on for hours. Well, I, I, I want to unpack something that you talked about because <clears throat> I'm reading right now the fate of empires. And one of the things that the, the author talks about in fate of empires is that um, they run about a 250 year course on average. <laughs> and we're coming up on that folks. Yep. We're coming up on it real quick, like 2040. And we're, we're kind of hitting that window of, are we going to make it or not? And we make some decisions <laughs> right now in 2021 that's going to impact where the next two decades go and whether we're mm -hmm. going to fail or succeed. And one of the things he also talks about, Steve, to your point is that we do a really good job of looking back on our history with rose colored glasses and just cherry picking the pieces of our history that we really like and that we're really comfortable with and that put us in position us in the best possible light where, whereas what we really need to do is turn that lens on the parts that we did not do well. And go, what did we learn from that? How did we overcome that? Is there something that we need to do in the future better? And I think that's where a lot of historians really don't, they don't do a good job of that. And we don't do a good job. I, I've always said if I was a, a president, I would have a cabinet member who is uh, secretary of history. <laughs> and you're going to look at the, the, seriously, the depth and breadth that makes not sense. Just of American history, but world history. And tell us where there's historical precedent for what we're doing and what we should be learning from this event. Because if not, we're just, we're doomed to repeat it. And I think that from the CRT perspective, you know, I was one of the only white kids in an all black school in Memphis, Tennessee. And I, I got the reverse thing and Shelby <laughs> County school system back in 1980 ish come up with this thing like um, there was a workbook. I don't know what they called it, but it was along the lines of critical race theory. And I knew that the friends that I'd finally begin to make in the African-American community in my school suddenly looked at me different when our homework consisted of your evil white slave master has just beat you and draw a picture of how you feel. And all of a sudden, all the eyes would look at me <laughs> look and, at I'm like, and I'm like, I didn't, yeah. you know, but <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> I don't know that blaming Dutch, you know, an eight year old child of any race for mm. the, the injustices that, that they, you know, people of the same skin color did. I don't know if that solved anything, but that's my two cents. You know, and, 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 and I agree with you. Um, I, I haven't, and I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't looked specifically in the critical, critical race theory as in depth as I'd like to. I've only um, taken an overview of it and done, you know, I've kind of, stuck my foot in the pool. I haven't jumped in to really get a deep understanding of it. But my stance is simply, we've got to understand both sides. I agree. And we've got to pull the politics out of things. And we've got to, on some level, you're, you're not going to be able to eliminate the emotion out of it. But we've got to pull some of the emotions out of this to get an understanding of what's happening. And those once we get to that point where, okay, what we've got left is the emotional stuff, then we've got to understand, is that emotion justified? I mean, think about it. If you had your family's history was, you know, for, you know, I look like we were able to trace both sides of my family tree all the way back to where they got off the boat in Africa or where they got off the boat in the States. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, when you think about it, um, you know, all the stuff that my family had done as slaves, building this country, making this country as strong as it had become, people refer to it in its prime. And then they go to slavery ends. They're now sharecropping. They're trying to do this and they're being taken advantage of. Why? Can't read. Yep. Can't understand math. You want to vote. You can't do this. And then if you look at our history and you see, where those minority communities that started to succeed, what would happen? You know, we Tulsa watch, riots. Watch, watch yeah, Rosewood. If you exactly. Seen I Rosewood, mean, watch absolutely. That. When you look at all of those situations, like where the success occurred, there was that devastating something devastating would would occur. The you know, one race would turn against the other, and it would just destroy 
a community. And now you're thinking, what would have happened had that been allowed to continue? And then both of those societies had a, would have integrated and become intertwined with one another for working towards one another's success versus uh, you've got yours, but I didn't get mine. So if I don't get mine, I'm going to come take it from you. You know, there's that perspective. And if we could just simply, like I said, take a look at what the problem is. And once you've identified the problem, you can then identify the cause. If you can remove as much emotion out of the issue as possible, and then try and get an understanding of the emotion that's left, why that emotion occurs, is it justified? And if it's not justified in your mind, is it justified in the other person's mind? Because just because you don't agree with it on the emotional aspect of it, doesn't mean it's not real to me. You know, when people say, well, there's not as much racism as there used to be, and you talk to many African Americans, they're like, that's garbage. <laughs> racism is just different. And that's the thing is, is what one person's perception of an issue might be and another person's perception of an, of, of an issue might be, you know, got to come to that kookamoo. Yeah, and I think that um, it's interesting because I, I really, uh, you know, being raised in the South, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've already talked about some of that, but also I, when I had my DNA test that I found out that I'm part Nigerian. Welcome to the family. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so as a light skinned, blue eyed white guy to find out that, uh, you know, I, you can trace back. And in 1740, I had a grandmother who was a slave, mm -hmm. which and, and if you take that one generation previous to that, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at two, a set of grandparents who were both uh, probably right off a slave ship. Mm -hmm. And it, it helps put in perspective, like the genes that I carry in me, the lives that that help get to who I am. I, I try to help that color, how I see things to, to maybe misuse a metaphor, but I think it's important for us as Americans to, to take a look at that. You know, we're going to have to really look at it or, or we're going to fail. You know, mm -hmm. we're just going to continue to let these emotions control us until we really put a rational mm -hmm. set of eyes to it. Right. You know, as, as a history teacher, I look at, like, as you mentioned a few moments ago, that we see empires start to fold between two and 400 years is typically the number that most of them mm -hmm. have failed or they contract. If you look at England, what happened with England, England used to be all over the world. Now it's happened. They've contracted. They've let go of some of their um, outlying territories. Um, some people still say they fall under the Commonwealth, for example, Canada and Australia, but let's be honest, Canada and Australia are their own independent countries. They just feel that connection. It's more of, more of an ally than a than royal subjects. Um, when you get to that 250 year mark and you really start to see the breakdown, you know we're starting to see the symptoms now. You know if we don't start addressing the symptoms, if we don't start addressing the cause, these symptoms are going to continue to get worse. They're going to continue to get worse. They're going to manifest. And at some point in time, if you think things are crazy now, if we as a society, and the thing is, is and this is where we have to be willing to reach out versus to contract. Because a lot of times when people are scared, what do they want to do? Pull everything in and pull things into themselves and keep themselves and their families and their friends and that community close to them. What we have to do is even though we're making sure we're protecting our families, we still have to reach out to understand. So I'm going to encourage everybody that's on right now to find someone of a different ethnicity than you, different belief system than you, different value structure than what you, what you perceive and reach out, take them out for coffee, Absolutely. take them out for dinner and have that conversation and ask for a deeper understanding. Ask for, hey, you know what? I really want to know what is it about your community that makes you feel threatened by me? What is it about your community that gives you an understanding? And tell them, ask them to say, hey, look, I'm not trying to accuse anybody. I just want to have a deeper understanding. And I think if we just all make that effort for that deeper understanding, that's going to address a lot of the issues because sometimes the biggest issue is I'm just not being heard. And if I'm not being heard, I know you don't want to understand my perspective. 
if you at least say, hey, look, I understand, I want to understand your perspective. Share with me why this happens. Share with me why this occurs. And broach the subject that says, look, I'm prepared to get quote unquote smacked in the face with some values and or with some discussion that I'm not comfortable with. I'm prepared to address those additional topics. And here's the big thing that you have to do. What does it Stephen Covey say? Seek first to understand, then to be understood. That's right. I always start off when I'm in a and when I'm in a tough position, I always tell people, like, share with me your perspective. Share with me why this occurred. Um, my daughters hate it when I do that. <laughs> hey, Dad. Um, hey, Liz, why why did you do that? I don't know, Dad. Well, I gotta un- you know, before I'm about to drop the hammer and ground you for the next six months. I got to understand why you did what you did. And if people understand a lot of times why something occurred, it may make sense. It may truly make sense as to why it occurred. And you're going, okay, if I were in their situation, I would probably feel the exact same way because now you have a deeper understanding of where they're coming from versus the understanding of what you've been doing and where you're and you're putting what your perspective is on that situation versus their perspective on that situation. No, I love it. I absolutely completely agree with you. And I, I know we're coming up. We got two minutes mm-hmm. left, Steve. So uh, I want to let's just go and close this out. We're going to have to mm-hmm. do round two, man, because here's where I want. Here's what I want people that are tuned in this morning or listen on the podcast to come or on Coffee the Rich YouTube channel. I want you to think about this. I think there's an opportunity here for us in the Second Amendment community, Second Amendment community, the two way community, to lead this charge, to bring the cultures together, to have these conversations because we do uh, approach. Maybe we have something in common. You know, we have guns in common. We have shooting in common. We can start from that commonality and that rapport that probably we share together and have some intelligent, rational non-emotional conversations that bring people together. And I would love to see our community lead that. Wouldn't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's that common ground that will help lay the foundation. I mean, and if once that foundation is laid, you can branch out from two way, you can then, you know, two way is kind of a political issue. Would we all agree on that? So you can actually sometimes have those political issues. You can extend it over into sports and then disagree with the fact that, you know, the Milwaukee Bucks, well, they won the championship and my Pistons are still <laughs> getting crushed. You can extend it into those things. Now you've got more commonality. So now it's easier to broach those harder subjects. That's exactly right. Tony says, great show, simplify rich and be all you can be, Steve, or whatever the army <laughs> says. <laughs> I like to be all you can be. That's the era I came in under. I'll stick with that. Yeah. Back in the seventies when you came in. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, where can people find you? Um, the easiest way to get a hold of me is, um, you can hit me on my Facebook. Um, it's just Steve Washington. You'll see a picture of my 13 year old playing basketball. I love watching my girls play or do whatever they're doing. I got to give a shout out to my daughter, Zoe and, um, Danielle, and then my daughter, Alyssa, who's in the national guard. Um, she's at AT right now. She told me she wanted to see this, but she's doing her AT thing. So, um, but that's the easiest way to find me. I I'm in the process of shifting over to USCCA. So I'm probably going to create a Facebook page called Big Steve with USCCA associated with it. So that's going to be the next place. And that should be up sometime this weekend. Um, but I mean, I'm just having fun. I mean, yeah. if you, if you, you'll see me wandering around the, uh, the coffee with rich page, I usually throw something in there. Um, but you know, if you need to reach out to me, the uh, I'm also available with the USCCA, which is steve.washington at uscca.com. Um, I'm having fun, man. This is just about understanding one another. Well, thanks for being you, brother. Uh, thanks My for pleasure. coming on, man. Thanks for inviting uh, me. Yeah, well, please tell me you'll do round two. I will do round two. Perfect. All right, guys, remember the fight is coming. Be ready. <laughs>